level access to privileged CPU features. So this is a 2012 paper. Traditionally, we have something like this for operating systems. We have our hardware, and on top of that, we have our OS, and on top of that, we have applications. And the delineation between these two makes you feel free and secluded. So what we have is an application communicates with the OS. where it has access to existing Linux, Linux abstractions, but it doesn't have access directly to the hardware. So the idea of Dune is really the following. We're going to go ahead and reconfigure a Linux process. And this is not by default, but this is the potential for a process, that a process can actually, instead of uh, being separated from the kernel via the CPL3, CPL0 layer, instead what we're going to do is provide an alternative. So let's put, for instance, here, Dune app. And by app, I just mean process, right? And the Dune process So the Dune process itself can be separated into CPL3 and CPL0, and separation between the OS, so the OS here, this separation is going to be done with root mode, non-root mode. So, we're, so what's provided is and added, so this is just the Linux OS, and we've got bolted on here a Dune kernel module, which is not all that large. It's something under 10,000 lines of code. This Dune kernel module allows you basically to transform a process from, so let's just look here. Okay, these all communicate with the OS via traps. When we switch to having non-root mode, root mode, this is going to actually be done for the VM call. Uh, a couple things to note about this. So these can run alongside ordinary processes. That's fine. And this is still a Linux process. It has memory associated with it. Uh, it can make system calls. The only difference is instead of using a trap to do it, it uses VM call because the traps will actually go from CPL3 to CPL0. At least that is the standard trap um, in Linux. I believe the trap yeah. interrupt 80 is what's used in Linux to cause a system call. So these will all do an interrupt 80. In the case of a Dune process and interrupt 80 would actually just take you from CPL3 to CPL0. So there's another way to make a system call, which is doing a VM call. And it's fully isolated. It's just isolated in a different fashion, right? It's isolated using the root mode, non-root mode, instead of using the CPL0 or the CPL3. The memory protection is provided because remember the Non-root mode has its own CR3, so it has complete control over its page tables. But the way that the protection is done, right? So if we look, for example, at these memory protection with CR3, so for all the non-Dune processes. For the Dune process, how do we get memory protection? With the EPT. So. This guy has its own CR3 register, and it's going to be mapping virtual addresses to, so Dune virtual addresses to Linux virtual addresses. And then the EPT will take you from a Linux virtual address to an actual physical address. So therefore, we can arrange it so that this Dune process, the same physical pages it would normally have access to, we're just doing that configuration in a different way. 
the way we configure normal applications, normal processes, is by setting up a page table, whether a page directory, a bunch of page tables for that process, and those all refer to some specific physical pages. Here, for the Dune process, we're going to set up EPT instead. We can have multiple Dune processes, that's fine. In fact, it's even possible to have multiple Dune threads with, within a process. Okay, we're going to look in a moment and see why this is important, what we can do with this. But what's important to note is the abstraction that we're providing to this non-root mode piece of code is not an entire virtual machine with its own hardware. Instead, we're providing a souped up process because it still has access to all system calls. The difference is it just has access to, for instance, fast exceptions. So uh, let's look at some of the fast exceptions we get. Page faults. Okay. Why is it faster than before? Because if we have an app over here that gets a page fault, that's going to cause us to go into the CPL0 mode here. right? Then that's going to go and find a general mechanism to send a signal back to this application. Instead, in the Dune process, we're going to just get a page fault exception right into here, and we can just deal with it however we want to deal with it. We don't have to go through this general mechanism of sending out a signal. We have page faults. Uh, what else? We might have divide by zeros. We might have other faults that go directly to the Dune CPL. So and then some of the exceptions are configured to go to Linux. They actually go into this little Dune kernel module here that we're then dispatching uh, out to Linux. The nice part about this is what it provides is multiple levels of protection within your own process. And you might say, why do I need protection in my own process? Right? What, why would that be necessary? Well, there are, let's look at a variety of different possibilities. So one would be library code that you're using. A good example would be a JPEG decoder. So if you have a process that does JPEG decoding, so you are here and you have a JPEG decoding library that you download from GitHub or wherever else, right? And so you feed in a JPEG of unknown origin. Okay, from the internet, let's say. Well, there could be bugs in that JPEG decode library that cause this process to now be able to, for instance, uh, make system calls. So it could do a lot of things on your behalf. Where would you do this? This, is, this might be, let's say, you're writing a web browser. Okay, so you're writing a web browser, you load a JPEG, someone out on the internet has crafted a JPEG that takes advantage of buffer overflow problems in a known JPEG decoding library, and then that will cause overflows, and then that will cause hostile code to be executed within the context of this process. So wouldn't it be nice if we could put this guy in a box? Put him in a box that's limited, and basically say, we're going to feed you in that JPEG. That's fine. But what you can do in that box is very limited. If you have a buffer overflow, go ahead, but you're not going to be able to make system calls for it doing that. So that's what we can do. That's the idea of sandboxing. We give this JPEG decoding a sandbox, and it can work in the sandbox, but it can't leave the sandbox. So leaving the sandbox would be, for instance, writing to the file system, reading from the file system, sending network calls, whatever we might propose as a list of what is this allowed to do. What it can do is read and write to memory. Maybe not even all memory, though. Maybe just a little sandbox area of memory. So here, Mr. JPEG library, you have access to, to this little sandbox of memory, and you have access to this JPEG. I'm not even going to let you read the file. I don't want you to do reading from the file system. I'm going to just give you the JPEG in memory and say, here, work within here, read and write. And when you're done, give me back the JPEG. Right? Give me the memory of the uh, decoded JPEG. So that's the idea of sandboxing. Uh, when I went to Google, for example, the requirement was any JPEG decoding, and there was a variety of other things, but any J JPEG decoding that you did had to be done 
assuming we were exposed to user JPEGs, had to be an unsigned sandbox. So you couldn't have that within the rest of your code. Let's look in a little more detail of how that would work. Right, so here's what we're going to do. We've got our hardware. We've got a Linux with our Doom module on it. And then we have a Doom process. And this Doom process sets up sandbox. So it sets up the sandbox running at CPL3. And then it's got other code that it's running at CPL0. If the sandbox code issues an interrupt, it's going to go into CPL0. If it is an interrupt 80, which is a system call, this process, again, let's say this is a web browser possibly, can go ahead and look and say, for the sandbox code I'm running, is it allowed to make system calls? Is it, and if so, what system calls is it allowed? So it can basically have a whitelist of allowable system calls for the sandboxed code. And it's going to get every one of them because it's going to be a handler for interrupt 80. And so it can look basically at each of the system calls as it allowed or not. If it's not allowed, it can just shut down this sandboxed code. It can inspect arguments. Maybe it's only allowed to open files in a certain directory. Maybe it's only allowed to send to a uh, certain TCP IP address, right? Something like that IP address. So who knows? Um, but it can go ahead and do that. Now, what happens if it decides, yes, this is allowed? How does it actually handle that system call? Does it have to somehow write it? No. What it does is it redirects using the VM call operation. So it redirects the interrupt 80, looks at it, says, yes, this is allowed, and then goes ahead and redirects using the VM call. The VM call goes down to the Dune module. The Dune module, in turn, sends it to a system call handler. The system call handler returns it back to the Dune module, and the Dune module will then return it back via a VM enter. And then the web browser, whatever the rest of this, can return back to the sandbox code with an item. The thing to keep in mind is this code in here, and by the way, there's a Dune library that does this work for you, so we don't actually have to handcraft it. This library will go ahead and handle system calls via interrupt 80, redirect them to VM call, and do this back and forth. You might say, okay, well, that's all well and good, but what if the sandbox code is tricky? Right? What if the sandbox code doesn't do an interrupt 80, but actually directly generates a VM call? So if there is a VM call in here, again, either uh, directly an executable code that you loaded as an ELF file, or more likely indirectly because of some buffer overflow caused by a JPEG decoding that put in a VM call. Anyway, what if it does a VM call? Well, the fact is, VM call will go directly to the root. So didn't we just ruin it and it can do system calls at once? No. The reason for that is the Dune module can inspect the state and look and say, oh, hold on a second, we were in CPL3. I don't allow VM calls from CPL3. I only allow them from CPL0. And then it can go ahead and kill this process or do whatever it wants to do to it. Uh, more likely just send back a protection fault to CPL. So that's kind of this idea of sandboxing. The idea that you can have this Doom process you can run part of your Doom process at CPL0, and you can run untrusted pieces of code at CPL3, or just code that you want to separate from one another. So let's look at some examples of how you might want to do this. Let's say you have a web browser. So here's our browser. I don't want separate pages to interfere with one another, but if I load a web page and I load a separate web page, I'd really like them to be independent of one another. That is, if I have something that crashes on the first web page, I don't want it to affect the second web page. So I can go ahead and have each web page in a separate CPL0. 
each of them can get their own memory space so that they cannot uh, interfere with one another. And then I could also load plugins. Let's say I have you know, a plugin for handling a particular type of media, uh, movie, audio, JPEG, and so on. Those plugins can all be done, again, as separate CPL0. So these are all, and I put CPL0, I mean CPL3, separate CPL3s, right? So they're limited in what they can do. That's really the idea of Doom. Let's look now at some time in Doom. This looks at the cost for instance, for a get PID. So for the get PID, we are looking at the, it's a very simple system call. So we're just looking at basically the cost of getting the gun, getting a round trip for making the system call. So we can see when we're using the trap, it's 138 cycles and it's about 900 for doing the VM call and the VM enter. Page fault is the cost for handling a page fault for the kernel to go ahead and fill in a zeroed out page. And so we can see uh, the cost, again, higher for using the VM call than the non-VM call in this case. And the page walk just looks at sort of the amortized cost of doing a fill, filling TLBs. And again, that's more expensive because on every TLB miss, we're going to do two page tables rather than a single page table. Here we can see how Doom actually does better. So one is with Ptrace. Ptrace is a mechanism for looking at for one process to see what system calls another process makes or to actually do single stepping in a process or set a breakpoint. So this is what GDB uses, for example. Uh, and we can see it's much, much quicker. Trap is the cost, basically, of a page fault within a program. So within a program, you go ahead and issue a page fault. And the trap is the cost of, so these are the Apple. -y. So this is for a user program to be notified via signal that a page fault has uh, occurred. And, or any, and in the Doom case, it is much quicker because we've just got the hardware working on that. Uh, here are costs for doing a bunch of protections and some unprotect. So this is a series of operations from that Apple V paper. You can see again, about an order of magnitude uh, cheaper in Doom, both for protecting one page or so on, and also protecting multiple pages. So what we find is Dune provides some similar benefits to an XO kernel, right? You've got raw access to the paging hardware, which makes the support of the Apple and late primitives quite cheap. So that can make things like garbage collection and some, some other things much more uh, performant than if we were using Linux directly, or even an XO kernel. Keep in mind, each Dune thread can have a different page table, right? because the CPL0 part of the code can go ahead and set up just a different value of CPL3 when it's switching to each of the CPL3 values. So the combination, really, of this VTX, extended page tables, IOMMU, allows direct execution of almost all the guest instructions. We're not trying to emulate an entire piece of hardware. Instead, we are in Doom providing a process that has additional capabilities because it can still use CPL0, CPL1, 2, and 3. In subsequent videos, we're going to look at how we can use Doom to do high-performance 